Hello, this is your host, Caroline Chambers. Welcome back to another week of So Into That, the podcast where I get to chat with really cool people about the things that we are into right now. Listen, sometimes I'm in with a guest who has so much knowledge to share with us that I forget to ask them any of my standard podcast questions. What are you into? What are you out on? Forget it all. That's exactly what happened this week with Vivian too. You guys probably all follow Vivian on Instagram, on all the social media platforms. She's so rad. She is your rich BFF and her new book, Rich AF, I devoured over the weekend. It is a basically a book on how to help you get richer that is written as if you're like sitting down for drinks with your girlfriend who's just really good at her finances and really got everything in check, in a good place. And you're just grilling her on like, what do I do? How do I, you know, what, what type of account should I be opening? How, how should I negotiate for this raise? She's the friend that you go to, to ask all of your kind of businessy finance questions. And she's put that all into a book. She's put it into so much Instagram and social media content that you can just scroll through to kind of get an idea of who she is and the type of knowledge she has. And then once you do that, and once you listen to this podcast, I know that you'll end up wanting to get her book, subscribe to her Substack, subscribe to her podcast, all of the things, because she just breaks down like finances in a really kind, empathetic, like I think our society, I think women especially, just aren't taught financial literacy from the get-go. Like where was this lesson in college on like, should I open a SEP IRA, a Roth IRA, a uh, you know, 401k, should I match? Is that where I should be putting my money? All of those things are just not taught. And as Vivian says, personal finances are personal. Yes, we all have to make our own decisions, but like, I don't know, having a baseline would have been nice. I was so completely financially illiterate until I met George, who luckily, you know, kind of took over and taught me much of this. But like, yuck, I don't want to have to learn about my finances from a man. George is out there shaking his head listening to this, but that's fine. Like, I'm grateful for it, but not everyone has that opportunity. Not everyone has a husband who is so like empathetic and has to teach them. And so they just don't learn. So, anyway, this or, you know, don't get married at all and just kind of remain financially illiterate. Like, it's a real system, it's a real thing that happens. So, Vivian is here to teach us all how to get richer. And she's fantastic. And I know that you will all enjoy this episode so much. So here is Vivian. Vivian too. Welcome to So Into That. I have been devouring your content for months and I begged your team to have you onto this podcast yeah. because I know that my audience has so much to benefit from what is in your brain, but is also now on your Instagram, on your podcast, in your book. Uh, but I'm going to pick your brain for about an hour and we're going to get all of the information that we can out of your brain and onto so into that. How's that sound? That sounds great. And thanks for having me. I was so bummed you're here. Um, tell me a little bit about why you wrote your book, because I know I have devoured the book. I've devoured all of the content that I can find on you. You are helping me get richer already. But tell me a little bit about what made you go, okay, I need to write a book about how to help people get rich. Yeah. So my book, Rich AF, it, it's like a, I would say a child of my audience asking me, me wanting to write a book and feeling like there wasn't anything else on the market that really addressed the things that I wanted to address. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously it started out with my audience hitting me up and just being like, we want a book. Um, yeah. I had not really thought about it that much at that point. I felt like I was still pretty new in my career, but people are saying things like, Hey, you put out a piece of helpful content every single day, yeah. but is there like an order we should be watching these videos in mm -hmm. is there a place where it's like, I can go through video one through a hundred and be better. Like, is it more organized versus so piecemeal? Because you can only get so much out in 60 seconds. Yes. And so I was like, okay, like what is an easy way to do that? And you know, I think there are certainly tons of people who offer um, courses or downloadables. Mm -hmm. And you, listen, that that works for some people. But for me, from a moral perspective and like an ethos perspective, I wanted any sort of tool to be really accessible. Yeah. Um, and so a book made a lot of sense. One, because 
books kind of max out at cost at like 30, 35 bucks. Totally. And, and then, I can get it from the public library, which exactly, I did. Exactly. Yeah. You can get it from the public library. You can get it through your university through one of those subscriptions that they already pay for. Yep. So I felt really good about that. I was like, yeah. there's a way for you to get access to this book, whoever you are. Yeah. But what I loved in your intro is basically this book is written as if you're at coffee with girlfriends, drink, mm-hmm. get margaritas with girlfriends. And you're like, the, you're the smartest one in the room who is really has a lot of financial literacy and like has it going on with their finances and all your friends are just picking your brain being like what should I do next what should I do next and you're like all right bitch you haven't done this so do this all right you haven't done this so like how do you not have a Roth IRA but it's incredibly kind there's nothing condescending about it and it's just like these are the things you need to do to succeed and every other like financial book is written as if you're coming from a place of like already understanding, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, you already have your MBA from Wharton. Like here's what to do with your money. And it's like, no, 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 no. I don't know what any of this means. Like, I don't know what a cap table is. Like start from the basics and that's what you've done. Yeah. And I, and you say like, you know, you sound like you're the smartest person in the room. And like the reason I wrote a book like this is because I'm not. All of my girlfriends from college are smarter than me. They after graduation from, you know, undergrad, they all went on to get secondary degrees. My best friend is currently a surgeon. Like yeah. there are others that are lawyers. They are, you know, to your point, like they've gotten their MBAs, they're VC investors, they're consultants. I was the idiot friend who yeah. was like, listen, I had a hard enough time getting my bachelor's degree. I want to graduate college. I want to go make money. That's yes. all I want. And I found it really frustrating that we don't get this education in school. And so much of the education was rooted in this like shame and judgment being like, oh, you shouldn't see the inside of a restaurant unless you're working there if you have debt. And like, you should eat rice and beans for every single meal until your debt's paid off. And like, it was just so demonizing. And like, I'm sorry, but that type of tone does not work for me. Yeah. I think something that I have struggled with in my entire life is like negative self-talk. Mm-hmm. I uh, I would never say some of the horrible things that I've said to myself in the mirror to my best friend. Yeah. And I think one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was like, if you wouldn't say it to your best friend, don't say it to yourself. I love that. And advice. Yes. That's why I wrote the book from that tone. And like, listen, I recognize I don't necessarily have the tone of voice that like a professional writer has, but I think that actually worked to my benefit because- oh, yeah. It, it literally feels like you are reading something your best friend wrote. I'm yes. not this hyper, you know, prolific writer who's using big words that you have to Google every five, you know, sentences. I'm, I'm literally talking to you like a friend and I'm coming to you from a place of warmth, of a hug. Someone said your book, it, it, she, was, she said, um, I never knew that a book could feel like a warm hug before. And I felt like that was just like best compliment I ever could have gotten so because good. that's what I wanted. Yeah. And because we're talking about like big, not huggy stuff, like finances oh. are traditionally – talking about finances is, it makes especially women, I will say, feel dumb and like mm-hmm. really, I don't know, out of our league and like, oh, this isn't – you know, this is just not something I need to understand. And so to make somebody feel that way is incredible. This is so not about me, this podcast, but my newsletter, What to Cook We Don't Feel Like Cooking, and my books that's coming out, that's exactly what I do. I write it as if I'm standing in the kitchen with my best friend. We're holding glasses of wine and we're like chatting. She sucks at cooking. And so I'm yes. like, I'm <laughs> like, I would never would never use a word like braise or sear. I'm like, put the steak in the hot pan and when it gets brown, turn it over. Because those words are what like turn people off from ever getting good at cooking, from ever getting good at their own finances, because they can't they don't understand it. So they're like, oh, this world isn't for me. But you take this and you're like, come on, bestie. Like, I got you. Let's do this together. It's incredible. A lot of my listeners are mothers. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a couple fathers in there, but let's be serious. Mostly mothers. And something I really like, it's both in the book and it was one of your, I think, quite viral videos on Instagram was basically about how to make your kids rich. Mm -hmm. The one on Instagram, especially that I saw was around basically starting a custodial Roth IRA for your kids and like employing them. So tell us about how, like I'm a content creator, so that's an easy one. They're my contractors. They appear in my content. What's something that your average stay-at-home mom or, you know, mom who's a lawyer or mom who's a 
you know, surgeon, what's something that she can do to set herself up? It's not only setting your kids up for success, it's also making your income less taxable. So talk to us about that. Yeah, I think it certainly makes it easier when you actually own your own business. It's a little bit harder when you okay. are a W-2 employee for somebody else. If you own your own business, you can employ your kid. Um, similarly to how Beyonce had Blue Ivy join her on tour as a backup dancer, how on every single DJ Khaled album now, you hear like some babbling at the front. That's Stop. Asad, his son. <gasps> and he's a feature on that track. Or Let's go, Asad. I mean, um, Drake's son Adonis with that like creepy uh, dog drawing he did. Oh, yeah. Yes. That was album cover. That was licensed to him. That was, you know, he paid a fee to his son mm -hmm. for using that drawing. Mm -hmm. And that is all money coming out of your business into the pocket of your child, yeah. which is going to allow that child to have earned income to then contribute to a, a custodial Roth IRA. Uh -huh. But let's say that you just have a regular schmegular job and it's not so easy. Um, Think about it this way. If your yeah. kid tutors younger students uh -huh. or maybe offers to drive a couple middle schoolers, if your kid is in high school, uh -huh. offers to drive a couple middle schoolers, drop them off at the middle school, and then take themselves to high school, uh -huh. and those parents are paying your kid a fee so that they don't have to do it, or yes. you know, they're mowing lawns or snow blowing or what, what have you. Okay. If a child makes money, and there is an accurate ledger kept. It can still be paid in cash. It can still be done whatever. But you need an accurate ledger of who paid, what time they paid, how much they paid, and what they paid for. Uh -huh. And that needs to be very, very clear. Uh -huh. It's even better if your kid can actually put together a little invoice. Um, yeah. Okay. What if it's what if my kid is two years old and I'm like I I'm a lawyer? What can you yeah. think of? Let's think of a creative thing. People are always like, I don't, you know, I don't apply to this. I'm like, no, everyone can apply to this. Like maybe they, yeah. If you have a law firm um, and you have a kid who's two years old, that can easily be, you know, you show your kid in the marketing signs that go on the bus bench or the billboard. Um, that's a way that you can pay your kid for their time as talent. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, and they were, I'll and they were really high paid talent. They, they made, were very high paid talent, but you have, made, to, <laughs> you have to spend market rate. You can't yeah. actually be like, hey, uh, my kid took two photos. That's $100,000 worth. It has to be market rate, but market rate for talent's pretty decent, um, especially if as a little kid, you know, I think about what's his name, Ryan's Toys or there's like- Oh my gosh, kid. Ryan's World. Ryan's World. He basically shows parents what toys are fun to then buy for their kid. If you, you were Ryan's parent, you could mm. easily hire Ryan and pay him millions of dollars for a full day shoot because Ryan does command that price because right. of the YouTube following. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So maybe my kids have a little bit of a higher price than, you know, somebody yeah. else's kids, but yeah. Yeah. Because okay. they're your kids. Yeah, I think that that is like the coolest thing ever. And and, and I don't know why we do like five hundred eighty five dollars a month because why do I there why is, is it that amount an annual? There's an annual cap on how much you can contribute to a Roth IRA and a custodial Roth IRA. The number does, however, change every year or every other year. Um, a couple years ago, it was six thousand dollars, sixty five hundred dollars. Now it's seven thousand um, dollars. So it will change. You don't need to memorize the number. And frankly, mm -hmm. I'm not even 100% sure what the no, number that's is. that's exactly what it is. That's why. It went up like – I know I know. we pay them $40 more a month this year. Or exactly. But it'll change every year. Yeah. Are you familiar with Eve Rodsky, Fair Play? Yes. Um, I watched Fair Play and I loved it. Yes. Okay. So Eve came on the podcast and I love her message of like, you know, split – the things, but like one of you take this card, which is, you know, dinner during the week. One of you take dinner during the day. One of you take mortgage. One of you, and we did that. And basically what happened, and she says this happens in most couples, most, you know, heteronormative, is that it? Whatever. Male and female couples is that the male takes the things that can be done like on his own time. And they're mostly like the finances and da 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 da, da. And then the female takes the like tasks that have to be done right away, like every single day, like food, dropping off the kids at school, dropping off the kids at sports. Da, da, da. And what happens also with that is that the female begins to 
if she had any financial literacy when she entered the relationship, it dwindles. So even me just saying that, like, I can't remember why we do 585 a month. That's because my husband is the CFO of the family. And something like, yes, we do have to divide tasks in a marriage 100%. But I do think that there's such a gap in female, especially like if you're a wife, in, in our financial literacy. And then what can happen, the, the divorce rate in this country is insanely high. And so then, and this is a part of Eve's thing too, like if you're not, if you don't have if you're not working and you're lacking all those skills, like you're kind of not setting yourself up for future success. What, what's your kind of take there? Like if you're, cause obviously being a stay at home mom rocks, what would you kind of suggest to a stay at home mom who is out of the workplace and plans to continue to be out of the workplace? Yeah. I think we as a society deeply undervalue the work that homemaker stay at home parents do. Mm -hmm. Um, They are tutors, chefs, chauffeurs, housekeepers, all of that, and then some. Yep. Therapists, all of that. What I think is really interesting is that household unpaid labor allows for somebody to then go out and do paid labor because things at home are taken care of. But typically, it's women who are doing that unpaid labor, and even if you are both outside working outside of the home. Um, there's a stat that says like women still do four to five more hours of unpaid labor at home than men. So I think that's one really troubling, but two, if you are a stay at home mom or a stay at home you know, woman, I think it needs to be a really honest conversation you have with your partner and say, you know, I've given up a career outside of the home to make sure that we can take care of things internally mm-hmm. Either it doesn't make sense for me to work because childcare would be more expensive or all of these things combined are reasons why there needs to be money set aside specifically for that partner to have their own money. Yeah. And the reason I think this is because even if there's one sole breadwinner, you should always have your own money. And I have gotten way too many DMs from women being like, I just found out that my husband cheated on me. We're getting a divorce. I don't even know what the passwords to the bank accounts are. I have no money. I've been out of the workplace for 15 years. So now I have to go back and start as an entry-level employee. All the while, right? those accolades that their partner got on the resume, they get to keep with them and they're not mm-hmm. splitting with you. You don't get to say, my husband became a senior VP while I stayed at home. Or like, I did 15 years of childcare while my yeah. partner climbed to the To allow ladder. him to climb the ladder, yeah. Correct. So yeah. you need to be having that money associated with the work that you're putting in. And an easy way to do that is to actually just for everybody to get a prenup. Yeah. I am big prenup gal. Yeah. And People are always like, well, that's easy for you to say. You have a lot of money. It's like, well, yes, but also like my prenup is incredibly fair. Yeah. Um, My fiance and I, we are getting married in June and we are going into our relationship or every dollar we have going into our relationship is going to be a 50-50 split. Every dollar made during our relationship will be a 50-50 split. However, my entire business is carved out because think about it this way. When mm. anything were to happen, I don't get to take all of his career accomplishments and put them on my resume. He should not get to take all of my accomplishments that I spent, you know, building this business with him because he didn't do that. It was me. Yeah. And so I think it's just a fair argument. And when we first started dating, he made a lot more money than I did. Mm-hmm. And he would pay for dinners and pay for more mm-hmm. vacations, paid a larger percentage of the rent. He was so good and so generous and kind and money was never an issue between the two of us. And I love that he didn't ever make me feel less than for making yeah. less. Yes. Gosh, so, I really entirely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now, you know, I've had a, the very good fortune of my business taking off and I am able to make significantly more money than he does now. Yep. And I want it to be just as fair and just as equitable in that, like, I never want him to feel less for not making as much. I never want him to feel like, oh, when you were making more, it was proportional, but now I'm making more, it's 50-50. You gotta hold your own weight. Like, it's not like that. We are going to be true partners in our relationship because we always have been. 
like um, it, it, business partners because marriage can be a business. I loved, I saw, I saw this on Instagram. You, um, you believe that a part in a partnership, whether you're renting, I think if you're for mortgage too, your, how much you contribute to the rent, the mortgage should be a percentage of your salary, not 50, 50, which I love and just puts into words. So it's again, treating a relationship like a business because some things should be treated like a business and take emotion out of it. Will you tell me about that? It got yeah. like, it was like so controversial and it was I like, know. literally like, how is this controversial? So tell us, everybody, tell us. everybody and their mother on the internet was calling me an idiot. Because and they were like, look at this gold digger. And I'm like, I'm oh, a sure. <laughs> um, it's I, I think it's controversial because um, when we think about like fair, that word, I think a lot of people don't understand what it means. Um, why would you ever want to put your partner in a precarious financial situation? I think yeah. that expenses should be a, a proportional burden on each of your financial situations. So when you're renting, it can certainly be, you know, hey, if we are moving into a $5,000 apartment, but you make more than me by a certain amount, you'll pay 3,000 and I'll pay two. Yeah. It's not like, a like everybody wanted to go immediately to the edge case, which was, I am a stay at home girlfriend and my fiance works very hard. Like that's what everybody wanted the story about me to be. And it's yep. not. Yep. I think, one thing to consider when it is about actual home ownership, that's a little bit more of a tricky conversation because that's equity you're building. And it's not necessarily fair for you to own something without having put dollars in, unless it's a situation where, to your point, you've come to an agreement, like I will be staying at home, I will be doing this so that you can do that. Yeah. Um, we bought our home before getting married. Mm -hmm. And again, I put in more money on the down payment, mm -hmm. but knowing, and this was at a point where like my career had kind of taken off, but knowing that for the first, you know, five years of our relationship, he paid for more vacations. He paid for more dinners. He paid for more everything. I said in our ownership agreement that even though I put more down, we were 50, 50 partners. Oh, that's cool. And I think people were very shocked by that because, you know, why you bought it? Yeah, why? You paid more for it. Like, you bought it. Because I'm not here to nickel and dime my partner. Yeah. I want them to be fair to me, and I want to be fair to them. Uh -huh. And that's how we should be thinking about money with our significant other. Because if you actually care about someone, and you make 10 times as much as they do, and you are putting an undue burden on their life, I don't know if that's how I would show love. Yeah, no. That doesn't feel fair or... No. Or loving in any capacity. At all. Yeah, I I I like that a lot. I it, it's tricky when you then think about um, like room being roommates with your friends because mm -hmm. like I had one roommate. I think I was making the most money when we were you know straight out of college in New York City. I think I was making the most money at like a whopping forty five k. Yeah. And my roommates were like in PR. So they were making even less than me at like a whopping 30 K. Like how did we live in New York city? I don't know, but that's tricky. Cause like, obviously I can't, I'm not going to like pay more rent to live with my friends, but I don't know, maybe, maybe you should, because then you can like afford to live in the place that you want versus the really shitty place that they can afford. Well, I think the conversation there is like, if you guys want to live together, yeah. If you take the largest room, you should pay right, a little bit right, more. Right, right. I'm not saying like if you are in a situation where you really want to live somewhere super duper nice and say you were making 150 grand and they were making 30, the math just may not math there because they're never going to be able to comfortably afford what you want. However, if you would be willing to live somewhere less nice and take the largest room with the ensuite bathroom and maybe a small seating area, Whereas they would each just get standalone rooms. Like that's a different conversation. So I just think, again, every situation is going to be different. Personal finance is personal, but totally. use a little bit of common sense, but also common courtesy. Yeah. How would you feel if the shoe was on the other foot? Yeah. 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 I like that. 
Um, you and I share a common pet peeve, and that is that it's complete BS that society has deemed talking about money to be tacky, and yet all the truly rich AF people out there are talking about money all the time. Uh, my husband got out of the Navy, went to Stanford Business School, and that was the first time that I'd ever been like around people who just talk about money all the time. They're talking about what they're investing in, who they're investing with, startup ideas, you know, people they they're they're going to cocktail parties just to meet like entrepreneurs who they can someday potentially invest in their startup. That was something that I had never been around and being around it has made us richer because now we have interesting things to invest in and yada yada. What is your like I don't know, if I'm friends with a bunch of people who are also kind of you used the word recently or, and maybe it was in the book, middle class as somebody called themselves middle class as like sort of derogatory. And you were like, dude, being middle class is awesome. Anyway. So if somebody sort of middle class who isn't at Stanford business school is trying to get richer, how do you feel about them? Like talking about money, how can talking about money amongst your peers, like help make you a richer person, more financially literate and stable? Talking about money truly is the greatest thing you can possibly do for your financial situation mm -hmm. because it allows you to know the actual information that you're dealing with and have more negotiating power. So if you are regular schmegular, don't have to have gone to Stanford Business School, like if you just want to talk to your friends about money, these are a couple topics that are great. Especially if you are young or broke or live in a major metro. One of my favorite questions to ask, and I don't know why I ask it the exact same way every time. I'll go over to a friend's apartment. I'll be like, oh my God, this place is so beautiful. Do, 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 do you mind me asking, how much do you pay in rent? But here's the thing. Once you find out how much your friend pays in rent, you are not only able to get a better benchmark of what is reality for that yeah. price. But two, I know a girl who did that. And then her friend was like, oh, and there's another unit across the hall opening up. And she was like, this is in my price point. I want to pay this for this because my apartment's way more expensive and way worse. Way shittier, yeah. Exactly. And so- and If we don't talk about money, we'd never find those things out. We'd never know that. And I'm from the South. So like talking about money is like out, honey. Like you are not allowed to yeah. talk about money. It's so tacky. And I'm like, this is putting women in a, in, it's making it impossible for us to succeed. Correct. And to your point, on the women on the women front, the second thing you need to be talking about is how much you make. Hell um, yes. I'll give you the story is I asked, so this this girl was like my work wife. I loved her. We were spending time outside of work. We're very close. This isn't something you have a conversation with like some random Joe Schmo you met 30 minutes ago. Sure. You just with a friend, like a friend that you know well. We were on the same team. She had a couple years of experience on me. So I knew she was making more. And I asked her, I was like, listen, I'm about to go in for my year end review. I want to negotiate for more, but I want to know what's reality. Mm -hmm. How much do you make? Yeah. She told me how much she makes. I went into my meeting and I asked for that number. I asked for a little bit more. I ended up getting what she was making. I felt amazing. And then I came back out and I said, <clears throat> redacted. I'm going to go to the bathroom. You want to come to the bathroom with me? And she was like, yeah. sure. We went to the bathroom. I then told her what I just got. Yes. And then I was like, you have four or five more years of experience on me. You are frankly better at this job than I am. You need to go ask for more money. And yeah, she goes, get in there. She goes, I heard you loud and clear. Yeah. She then goes into her meeting later that day, asks for more money. Yep. Suddenly I'm making her old pay. She's making more money. And I know next year, guess what number I'm asking for? The number she got this year. And so not only did me having the gall to do that increase my income, but it increased my best friend at work's income. And so yes. both of us are making more. We're both happier. And now I have a lay of the land of what I should be asking for because I just had the guts to ask. And so like literally, how are we supposed to know? We don't know what these companies are able to, willing to pay unless yeah. we talk about it with our peers. There are some companies that apparently have it in their policy that you like aren't allowed. That's to illegal. Just, that's illegal, right? That's illegal. You can't do that. So. That's crazy. Like, and, and so we've been like shamed into thinking that talking about salary is like not allowed. We'll, we'll get fired for it. We're, we're the tackiest people alive when like actually that's just like the world 
or like society trying to not pay us our due. You have to talk about salary. I recently was interviewed for an article and the woman was like, do you mind if I ask about my sub stack? And she was like, do you mind if I ask how much you make? And I was Mm -hmm. like, you know what? I don't mind. I'll tell you exactly what I make because how are other recipe developers and sub stackers and whatever going to know the potential and their worth if, if I don't say it. So I said exactly how much I make. I make about like I think 20,000 now dollars per post. And she the, the article title was Caroline Chambers isn't afraid to talk about money. And I saw that in my inbox and I was like, <gasps> I look so tacky. I looked, I look, oh my God, oh my God. And I literally closed it. I didn't even read it. I put my phone away. When I picked my phone up, it had like blown up with other sub stackers, recipe developers, cookbook authors being like, thank you so much for being mm-hmm. honest about this. Like nobody in their industry talks about how much they're making, how much their cookbook advances are, how much, you know, how how many subscribers they have, which translate to what I am so like, oh, I just hit, you know, 10,000 paid subscribers. I just hit 15K subscribers. I just hit 20K subscribers. Whatever. I talk about it constantly because there are so many women who follow me and you who are trying to do their own thing and they don't know the potential. And so they might not take the leap because they're like, oh, I don't know. Like, is it worth it? Is it is it worth my time? Is it worth my money of investing? You have to talk about it, especially, I mean, I, I know I keep talking about us women, but like I have been in a room with 15 men from Stanford Business School who yap nonstop about their finances. And then I've also been in the room with 15 women from Stanford Business School. And even they are talking so much less about it. And they're not getting, you know, they're not getting included on these cool deals. And they're not like in it. They're not in the world as much. And that's insane. We have to all talk about our finances. Agreed. Less tacky, more talk about you can't, it's impossible to know your worth if you don't know like your potential worth. You know, if we don't talk about money, we're not setting ourselves up for success. Um, Oh, okay. I saw on your Instagram stories recently that you have a bachelorette party coming up. So fun. (laughs) Vegas. Yep. In your book, you have an exact, and this is maybe even, I'm assuming maybe you wrote the book before you were even engaged. You have a script for asking people to be in your wedding party because something that really freaking bankrupts people in their 20s is what? The number of weddings that they have to attend. It's insane. I mean, it's literally the only thing. It's You spend all your vacation days. You spend all your money. And a lot of the time, it's Thursday afternoon. Our flight's the next morning. And what are we saying? Oh, I really don't want to go to this wedding. Yeah. So you have this script in your book that I'm obsessed with. Can you tell me about it? And also, can you tell me when it came time to invite your own best friends to be in your wedding, did you use it? So first, tell me the script. I mean, you might not remember it verbatim, but. So the script was actually, um, if you were invited to be a bridesmaid or go on a bachelorette party and you were like, straight up, I cannot swing this. Um, So you go back to your friend and you're like, hey, hey, Carol, um, thank you so much for letting me be a part of your special day. I'm so honored. We've been friends for a decade now and I cannot wait to be there by your side. Hmm. That said, between the engagement party, bridal shower, bachelorette party, and the actual wedding itself, I don't think I'm going to be able to financially make all of that happen. I've got some other personal financial priorities such as paying off my student loan debt, buying a car, saving a down payment for a home. I would love to know from you, what are the highest priority items? And then you would respond to me. Mm -hmm. I would then be like, oh gosh, Vivian, I feel so sad that you can't come to all of it. I'm kind of a bridezilla. Are you sure? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Um, You can then follow up and say, you know, I feel like I would like to prioritize your bachelorette and your actual wedding for the bachelorette. My budget is X, Y, Z, whatever you feel comfortable with. And then this is the key line, my friend. You say, that is what I'm comfortable and willing to spend. However, I do not want to hold you back. So if this is not going to align with what you want to do, that's totally fine. I'm happy to take a step back and support you in other ways. Yep. If your friend is a decent human being, they will not be a jerk about this. Yeah. And if they're not, they're not your friend. Right. 
maybe it's time to drop. Maybe it's time to trim the fat and uh, shake, mm-hmm. shake that one out. Yeah, it's insane that we say yes to being bridesmaids and then in our inbox – Two months later appears this invitation to the bachelorette party in which it's like, okay, everybody, and splitting the house on the beach in, you know, Miami will be $3,000 each and the club fees will be $1,500. It's like, wait, wait, what? I mean, we're spending multiple thousands of dollars on bachelorette parties when that is like the trip of the year for a lot of people. So yeah, yeah, basically just more of more say no. Say no is kind of the and then thing there. The, the tea with my wedding is I'm actually not having any bridesmaids because oh. I love my friends yes. and I want them to enjoy the day and I don't want them to buy some yucky dress that they'll never wear again. Don't I feel want my pretty friends in. To like me. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, no bridesmaids. Yes. That's it. I am having my bachelorette. Yeah. I think my my fiance is going on a golf and fishing trip with some of his boys and cool. he's making it a little bit smaller. He's they're certainly spending a lot more money. Yeah. And the reason why we thought Vegas would be actually such a smart way to go is because <clears throat> one, flights to Vegas from literally anywhere in the US are like $150. Dirt they're as cheap. cheap. Vegas is Vegas is like, get over here. Yeah, Vegas is a con. Come, Come on. on. Hurry. Hit it. Hurry um, up. So one, that really reduces flight costs. Yeah. For hotels, we are going to be sharing rooms. Um, and then as it pertains to parties and nightlife, being women in Vegas, yeah, I think yeah. it, it goes without saying, things are going to be cheaper for us than they would be a a bachelor party. I love that. That's going to not only help us save money, but also on the instance that we do want to buy a table or get a cabana for the pool party, whatever, they actually do offer discounted pricing if your entire group is women. Listen, ask not what the Patriot... Let's go. Patriot could do for you. I'm ready to spend half as much as a boy's table would. Yep. These are the moments when we use being a woman Woman to to our advantage. Oh my God, I'm obsessed with that. Okay, everyone get your bachelorette parties in Vegas planned because you're basically saving money. That's girl math. Yeah. (laughs) That's Vivian math. That is Um, math. We talked a little bit about negotiation and I want to get into it more because so many of these listeners are in traditional jobs where negotiating is key. You said it well in the book. Negotiation is so cringy. This is one of the like things that I read, and I was like, "God, we're so lucky that we have a book that is written for you know in our language." Yeah. Um, that being said, you also talk about how important it is, and so many people. You, you shared a statistic in there. Just skip this step entirely. They yeah, accept a job that you know. Here's your offer. They just accept it. They, you know, go to their annual review. They're not offered a, a, a salary bump. And so they don't ask for it because they think, oh, I'm so lucky to have this job. Oh, I'm just grateful to have this job. So many people don't have a job at all. No, that's not what we do. Talk to us about negotiation. I kind of want to like spend some time on this. Like why is negotiation important and how should I do it? Yeah. Negotiation speaking a second language, asking for a discount, all of those things are tacky when you're broke and classy when you're rich. Yes. And honestly, ick. Like negotiation literally feels like you're begging for money, which sucks. Um, That said, you're not. Mm -hmm. I like to think of this as a little bit of a dance, a dance between you and your manager. Yep. And – the way you have to think about it is that Forbes actually Forbes actually did a study that if you do not get um, a meaningful raise in promotion every two years, um, or you just don't leave the company every two years to go get that pay bump, over your lifetime you will make half as much. Half fifty yeah. percent. I can't. And afford people to make give. Half. And people give our generation. Are we the same generation? Are you a millennial? Are yeah, I'm a, I'm a millennial. People give millennials um, so much shit for bouncing around all the time. But, like, guess what? We're trying to get that money. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, people give us, I feel like, our generation so much shit because we bounce jobs all the time, at least in my kind of social circle. Jobs are bounced. and pe- uh, No, bounce jobs. Or do what Vivian's about to tell you. Yeah. So, basically, when it comes to negotiating, think about it this way. 
the person who talks less has more power. And what I say is before you start a job, you need to use a script that's basically like, thank you so much for this offer. I cannot, I can't wait to start. However, I would love to see if there's any flexibility in this offer to go closer to X, Y, Z, whatever the number makes sense for you. And you're going to do this after you've gotten a, you know, call from HR offering you the job. They're going to go back and see what's possible in the budget. And more often than not, in instances where I've done this, I've gotten money. Yeah. I got I got a higher starting salary just because I asked for one at my last job. Every um, time. Every time. And then once you're actually there, it's all about having the receipts. Mm-hmm. You need to have a brag book where you forward every single positive thing that anyone has ever said about you at the company, anytime you've been praised, anytime you've gotten a, an award or a you know gold star, forward it to a folder. Forward it to a folder. So then brilliant. Check, check that folder. Call it your brag book and the year. Yes. And then forward it to that folder and then come mid-year and end of year reviews. You literally have an arsenal of all of the times that you knocked it out of the park that you can then just use as justification as to why you deserve what you're asking for. Yes. And I always say you have to ask for 10 to 15% on top of what you're currently making. And people okay. always balk at that number. Listen. There's a different conversation to be had when you work at a nonprofit or perhaps for the government or something like that. But if you are a private company worker, you need to be asking for that. And then you need to say this, this, and this showcase the value I've brought to the team over the past year, a raise of XYZ would be commensurate. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to stop talking. Yeah. Go. Shut up. You're going to stop talking and it's going to be so awkward. Okay, like- hold on. So I'm reading three highlights from my brag book. I, you know, signed that deal. I negotiated that contract. I da-da-da-da-da. I deserve this. Shut up. Okay. Then you stop talking. Okay. You are going to want to fill that dead space so badly. And I did during one of my first negotiations. I did this incredible work. I put together like, you know, things that I earned, the value I brought, what I was asking for. And then I was like, but if not, that's okay. Why did I say but that? But I totally, but I totally understand you can't do it. But literally, and you and you say it like word vomit, and yeah. it's awful. Yeah. And so I always just say, just stop talking. Just let it be awkward for five seconds. Because when you fill that awkward space, you are negotiating against yourself. You got to let your manager fill that awkward space and t- have them tell you no. Yep. So there's three scenarios, right? Instantaneously, your manager says, yes, great. You really deserve that raise. Unlikely that'll happen. Yeah. There's also the opposite cases where they instantaneously say no. And also, unless you're like the worst employee ever, which by the way, you should know if you're the worst employee ever, they're not going to say that to you. Mm -hmm. What is going to happen more often than any other result is they are going to come back to you and say, okay, I can't give you a yes or no right now. I need to go speak to HR. I need to check the budget. I need to see what is possible. Yeah. What I like to do is I make this ask during the summer and then I follow up every two months from then. Don't be annoying about it, but like you need to be persistent because what ends up happening is that corporate budgets typically get set in like October-ish maybe give or take a month or two, but they get t- they get set right before the end of the year. Yes. So if you are asking in December for a raise, you're already too late. Yeah, they've already set the budget for the year. Oh my God, that's so brilliant. I've never heard this. When I was still working for other people, I always waited until my annual review beginning of December. <gasps> It's too late, babes. If you if you're if you see the Christmas trees, it's too late. It's too late. And they've so, already Oh my gosh. When you asked in the summer and you asked again early fall and then you asked again late fall, you're going to hit roughly around the point when budgets are set. And then your manager is going to have this budget and this budget is going to have to basically give raises to everybody on the team who deserves one, who your yes. boss wants to give one to. The problem becomes if your boss is not thinking of you, you're not top of mind, that money's going elsewhere. Mm-hmm. They need to know you value money. That is a good way for them to show that you are valued, that you are being yes. you know, supported to the company. And that way, if anybody else forgets to ask, like, 
they're probably going to get forgotten about. But yeah. I make it so that I am at the top of the pile every single year when my boss is thinking about giving money out. My my name needs to be the first name they're seeing in their yep. head. Yep. And that way, when it comes time for end of year reviews, I'll tell you the funniest thing that happened. My last year working a corporate job, we walk, I walked into my end of year review. And before I could even get a breath out, my boss goes, I'm going to stop you right there. You've been asking since the summer. Don't worry. I got it for you. Please don't harass me. Amazing. And I just started laughing because I didn't even need to say anything. He was like, great. I got you 12%. Listen, I hope you're happy with it. You're going to be promoted. Like, da 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 And he said all this. He like filibustered. He, he, was, really he was the one. Yeah, he was he the was one like, awkward babbling. And then I just sat there. I smiled. And, you know, when he gave me, he's like, are you happy? And I'm like, I'm satisfied, even though inside I was overjoyed. Obviously, I'd gotten everything that I'd wanted. Yep. And so I told him, I'm satisfied. Thank you. I really appreciate it. He was like, keep up the good work. Go yeah. send in the next person. I'm like, cool. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Like, I didn't even have to argue for yeah. myself yes. when the time came because I had already done the legwork ahead of time. Yeah. I love something you said in the book that was – you know, negotiation, getting your brag book together and uh, kind of planning out what you're going to say and actually having the meeting itself is probably only going to take you two hours. Like total, it's going to take you two hours. Like, yeah, it's going to take you more hours in like stressing the F out if you've never done it before. But once you've negotiated a few times, like it becomes a muscle and it's not scary anymore. So it's probably going to take you two hours. And so in two hours, like what's your, what's your hourly rate? You know, a thousand dollars or fifty fifty dollars, like it's somewhere in that range. When are you ever going to make twenty five hundred dollars an hour if you're getting like a five thousand dollar range? Like it's so worth it. Yeah. And if they don't give it to you, if they're not valuing your work, if they're not seeing you as um as an as an employee who deserves a salary bump, then you need to go find another job because you're leaving money on the table, right? That's, exactly. That's kind of what you said. Um. Oh. I've been a freelancer. I've been a freelancer for 10 years now. And something, and I consider myself pretty financially savvy, uh, you know, a strong financial literacy at the very least. I had no idea until I found you that, okay, I've always looked at my friends who have 401ks and their employers are matching their 401k. I've always looked at them and been like, oh, I'm so jealous, So such a bummer. I can't do that because we want to put as much money into our 401k as we want to max it out every year, right? If we can. I've always been like, oh, such a bummer. I can't do that. I'm such an idiot, Vivian. I'm my own employer. I can do that. Yeah. I can do that. I can match my own 401k. Mm -hmm. Who the heck knew? There's just so many nuggets of wisdom in the book. I think to close out our hour together, if you are going to give me like, three nuggets of wisdom that you have that you think the most people are, or like you, you pick how many that the most people are like, oh, I had no idea I could do that. Or oh, this has made me, you know, $10,000 this year. What are like the things that you tell people that are just like total slam dunks every time? Yeah. Okay. So there is a website. It is called missingmoney.com. Um, I know it sounds like a scam, but it is not. Um, it is actually a, database that the government uses. So yeah. think about all the times that you paid fees or deposits and you're like, where did that ever go? There were, you know, potential like insurance payouts or um, security deposits on apartments or things like that, that like, you were like, oh shoot, I moved away. I changed my address. I never got that money back. And you just thought it was gone, mm -hmm. missing, done. Mm -hmm. If you go to missingmoney.com, It'll like you redirect you to your actual state's website, which is going to have some crazy long URL. So like, don't mm -hmm. worry about it. Just go to missingmoney.com. You are going to type in your name and some basic info about yourself. And they're going to pull up addresses. And you're going to be like, hmm, did I live at any of these addresses? Yeah. And if you did, that's your cash, babes. So and fun. I did this for myself, nothing. My fiance, nothing. My parents, nothing. I did it for my fiance's dad and he had uh, $35 from some random insurance payout like yeah. years and years and years ago that he'd never claimed. And at first he was like, is this a scam? Yeah. But then he looked into it and, you know, directed into the right site. Da, da, da. He got a $35 check in the mail for clicking a few buttons and Amazing. 
he texted me a photo of the check and he was like, I feel like I just won the lotto. Absolutely. And it made me laugh because that is such a small, cute example. I had another woman DM me and she said, this was like the most life-changing, honestly, DM that I've ever gotten. She said, I just want to let you know, I went onto that site you told us about. I found my name. I looked into it. I had a long-term boyfriend. I don't think they were married. Yeah. Who had a life insurance policy of which I was the beneficiary. He tragically passed away and I didn't know that he had this like policy. So I didn't know to go claim anything or anything like that. I am about to come into a seven figure sum of money. You have single-handedly changed my life. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. obviously that comes from a very, very sad experience. And sure. But like, with. but for someone to tell me that her watching a 60 second video yes. changed the entire trajectory of her life. Yes. I mean, yeah, no, that's, that's insane. And also like, that's where he wanted his money to go. That's why he set up the policy. Yeah. So like, what a beautiful thing. Okay. I have to tell you, I did this based on your advice. I told mm -hmm. you, I've been following you for months, maybe years, missingmoney.com. And my Second house in college in Chapel Hill, Mint Springs Lane, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I the heat or something was in my name, and I got yeah. like two hundred fifty dollars. I mean, that's two hundred fifty dollars. You didn't have like that's two hundred fifty dollars. I didn't have. Oh my god! And my husband always loves to be like, he's you and him would really wrap out. He he's like two hundred fifty dollars now. That's you know in ten years that'll oh be. My god. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's you it. invested that $250 oh, yeah. today. Yeah. You're like, yeah. babes, I'm spending this at Target. In Literally, Target. I'm headed to buy a new sweater. I'll, I'll come home with a new pair of pants for him. Like, you know, a $100 pair of pants. And he's like, I don't need those. Like, I've already got two pairs of pants. Like, if we put that in, if we put that money into, you know, Jack's startup, if we put that money into <laughs> the SEP IRA, I'm like, I, I like, he's like, two pairs is enough. Thank yeah, you. yeah, two pairs is enough. I, I wash one, I wear the other. I'm like, George, I cannot with you. Um, okay, that one's a really fun one. Give me, give me one more. Okay. Um, a high yield savings account, I think is so critical for multiple reasons. Okay. First and foremost, for everybody listening, you need to have an emergency fund. Yeah. On my 25th birthday, the day I was having a party, I chopped off the tip of my finger. I went to the ER. It was 16 grand. And after insurance, it was $1,300. Bro, I had the worst birthday party of my life for $1,300. And that money I had set aside, thank God that covered the bill because mm -hmm. it was just one less thing I had to worry about. So I really recommend having an emergency fund three to six months if you are single, six to 12 if you're head of household, have kids, inconsistent income, anything like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Here's the other thing. Smart. Freelancers, my friends, we got to pay taxes every single quarter. Sure so do. That money that you have earmarked you know, typically every dollar that comes into a, a freelancer's business, I say set aside anywhere between 30 to 50% because you just have no idea, depending on what state you in, you're in, like where that could end up. So I say 60, set that money aside. 60. Right. If you're in California, 60. it could be even more. <sighs> um, but I set that money aside into a high yield savings account. So I'm earning interest. I'm earning literally oh. dollars in the couple months that I have to wait to pay the tax man. So then I pay the tax bill and I have an extra couple thousand that's just mine. Do you use a high yield saving account for like your funny money account? Like for your everyday spending account? Uh, so what I do like is- when do I, I not use it? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think high yield savings accounts, just given how easy they are, you can use them for a lot of things. Yeah. However, with a savings account, whether it's high yield or a traditional brick and mortar you find on the corner, mm -hmm. you can actually only withdraw money six times a month. Okay, so, with a high yield. Yeah, no, with every type of savings. Oh, with every. Oh. People okay. don't know that though. Okay. You just never had to withdraw six times from your savings account. But right. there is a limit for both traditional regular banks you see on the corner as well as high yield savings accounts. So I wouldn't pay your bills out of that account. Right, too many bills. But okay. There's just too many things happening. But for bigger expenses or bigger bills that you're going to pay in chunky increments that you know exactly when you'll need to pay, like once every three months, 
it's use your saving use your high yield savings account because or even just the mortgage are. maybe yeah but but you you do something interesting okay so thank you high yield savings account i feel like is a real missing link that is just so easy that people aren't doing like we don't want to keep that much money in savings but if we are keeping this emergency fund savings which we all need to be one of my best friends smartest girl in the world just got laid off cannot find a new job she's like you know I planned maybe on not having a job for two months. She can't find a new job. She's like, thank God I have so much in savings, but like it sucks. I'm burning through my savings. So anyway, we have to have the savings account. Keep her your emergency fund in your high yield. So smart. You do something else though. Now I'm interrupting my own question of like, just give us these cool tips because I think this is such a cool one. You keep a separate account for like many different aspects of things that you have to pay for. Will yeah. you tell me about that and why you do that? Yeah, I think it's just an easier way to manage your money and the cash flow because if you have all of your money in one pot, you don't really understand what you have and what you can spend. Whereas mm -hmm. I have an account that is specifically for my mortgage. Yes. I have an account that's specifically for my rent in Florida. I have an account that's specifically for my credit card payment. And then I have an account that's like, this is money that you can just play with. Yeah. I have different accounts at different Funny money. Yeah. I have, you know, business banking accounts. I have an ATM account that like, I know that brand does not charge me ATM fees so I can go anywhere I need to go. Uh, um, yep. And this just helps me have a very quick snapshot of my financial picture from jump just by giving in like a quick eyeball of like, how many dollars are where versus, hey, you have a really large sum of money in this one account. You feel really good about yourself. Oh, but by the way, the rent and the utility bill and your credit card payment and the Wi-Fi and the telephone bill, they're all hitting on the same day. Oh, you're overdrafted. Yeah. Yeah. But because actually overdrafting sounds like a not rich AF problem, but rich AF people are not keeping money in their checking account because their checking account ain't getting anybody richer. No. So overdrafting should be over the potential of overdrafting should be a concern on your list should be a real risk. My we're renovating our house right now. And like, it, it I don't know if you've ever renovated a house, but like, it just won't stop. Like I keep thinking like, okay, we're really done. And then the next month is another huge bill. And I'm, paying for it from mine, which then comes out of this big pot because we don't have these individual checking accounts. And my husband last month was like, babe, if you're going to have an, this high bill, you have to tell me like, because I paid our mortgage and we were so close to overdrafting. And I was like, oh shit, I didn't even know that like, I, I, I didn't realize. But that's why that is such a smart tip. And you can put, then you can put this money for your mortgage instead of keeping it in a checking, you're keeping it in a high yield. So you're basically, you, you don't get a traditional, um, income like me. We're getting income from a billion different places. Uh, not, not a billion. We're getting income from several different places. I wish a billion. Um, and so it's not as clear cut for us, but if you are the lawyer, the surgeon, you can go in and like on your first day of work, when you set up your account, you said, okay, I want it all to go into this checking. You can go back, right, to HR and say, I want, and you can figure out your percentages and you can send it directly to all these different accounts that you set up. Yeah, I love that because it takes all of the thought out of it. The whole thing with finance is make it easy for yourself and it'll be mm -hmm. more likely to, you'll be more likely to actually stick to it. Yes. So instead of being like, oh, every single time my paycheck hits, I'm going to move $200 into my savings account. It's like, no, no, no. Just tell HR that from jump, you want yeah. your whole paycheck minus $200 to go into your checking account mm -hmm. and then that $200 to go somewhere else and you won't see it out of sight, so out of mind and you won't spend it. So smart. Yeah. It's like, I guess, yeah, you can always just save, but like doing even more smart, this to a high yield, this to a everyday checking cuts. It's just so smart. And all of these tips you can find either on Vivian's Instagram for a first taste of who she is. Um, Vivian, tell us where we can find you. You're your yeah. dot rich BFF. Yeah, no. So you can find me across all social media platforms. Just search the three words, your rich BFF. And then for um, my book, you can snag a copy at richaf.me. You can get the physical version, the ebook, the audiobook. There's signed versions. So whatever I also want to I also want to plug that 
that book has kind of like worksheets within it. And she also has free downloadable um, kind of more worksheety things at another website. That yes. So that's a secret website that you can only oh. get access to if you get the book. Um, but there's actually a QR code in the book that there are like action items I want you to follow. It's not just about reading this book. It's about actually doing the things we talked about. Yeah. And that way you'll actually improve your financial situation. But there's tons of digital resources that are all free if you get a copy of the book. Um, but yes, richaf.me to get that book. And then you can also actually find me on Substack. For oh. My Substack is called Enriched, E-N-R-I-C-H-E-D. Um, and you can find me uh, as a podcast host with net worth and chill net worth and chill is such a good podcast <laughs> name okay so i will link obviously to her Substack and tag her since that's easy to do within Substack. um from my own Substack, what to cook dot substack.com vivian thank you so much for making us richer i'm so excited for everyone to put just even if you just put one of these into place like it's going to make you richer so get the book and get a lot richer it's awesome thank you thanks for having me